So how many are watching this uh, hangout? Do you know, Abhita? Uh, how many people? Yeah, have signed uh, in. I am members. just going to embed the link. Uh, Rajesh, I... Yes. What, Amnita? Sorry, you said Rajesh something. Uh, I was going to embed the link. This is the link, right? It, uh, yes. It. It's at the top of the screen, usually. Yes. And... Uh, Paste it just, on our Yeah. We, you know, we have a Facebook uh, group, and uh, we're just going to paste it there so that people can do a live mm -hmm. live streaming. We can they can see it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anita, if you can post that uh, link here in the chat window, I'll also put it on our. I'll do that. Group. I'll do that. Just, just one minute. Just, just a minute, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. Ma'am, you could post it on your Facebook page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we just posted it on Avnita Ma'am's Facebook page, sir. Okay, and also wait, you wanted it yeah, in, in the, the window, window, right? Yeah. Just put it. Hello. Yeah, just a minute. Okay. So we're ready to start and good morning yeah. once again to uh, everyone. Welcome to Drishtikon 3.0, an initiative of RN Pradha School and for the first time on Google Hangouts. In the Hangout, we have our students from class 12 sharing their perspective on the big question of education. We also have our special guest for today, Dr. Sujata Ramdurai, Professor of Mathematics at TIFR, currently at the University of British Columbia, Canada, a member of the Prime Minister's Scientific Advisory Council and a member of the National Innovation Council. We also have Dr. Rajesh Kasuri Rangam, faculty member at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore, where he heads the Cognition Program. He has a PhD in Cognitive Science from MIT and a PhD in Mathematics. Both our guests are keenly interested in education and how it can be scaled for our country through their Gyanom project. Thank you very much for being with us on this Hangout, Dr. Sujata and Dr. Rajesh. I will now hand over to Ajit Nair, the moderator for the entire program. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us, all of you. Um, Drishtikon is an event which is very close to our hearts at RN Poda School. It is a time when we hand over the, uh, the space to our students and we ask them to think and to ideate and to express their views on, on any problem which we believe is very pertinent to our times. And uh, the amount of mental exercise that often, you know, it, that entails it, it's not just an event of one day, it's a month beforehand where people are thinking and rethinking and revisiting problems that otherwise go under the radar. And you know, that learning that our students gain from that, that would be reason enough for us to run Drishti Kon. But uh, something amazing happens every time we do it. When we ask our children to explore an idea and when we don't hold the reins, uh, we don't hold them back anymore, we realize that sometimes they create something brilliant. They come up with ideas that as adults we feel responsible to give wings to. We want them to hear these ideas. We want these ideas to be heard by the entire world. And so therefore we decided that this year Drishtikon should be an online event so that in no way are we being irresponsible with these beautiful ideas that they created. A word about our topic today. So this year at Drishtikon 3.0 we took up a topic that uh, is very pertinent to our lives and to the lives of the students that are speaking today and of course our uh, chief guests today, uh, both Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Sujata. And um, this is what we told them. We said that education is supposed to provide solutions. So when did it become the problem? And um, in fact, there is, uh, when we were looking and we were researching, we found a very interesting system where uh, it's called design thinking where it is education with a view to teach problems
problem solving and uh, it's it's provided at some of the most elite universities of our time and so we decided to turn education upon itself we said let us apply the model of design thinking to the problems of education today and so that's what we did and step one of design thinking always is to define and understand the problem and so that's what we asked of team one so we asked them can you define and understand what are the problems with education today so this is what we got team one are you ready yes sir all right here it is a very good morning to one and all i feel privileged to share my views on education today the wealth that cannot be stolen neither abducted by state nor can it be divided among brothers neither it is burdensome to carry the wealth that increases by giving that wealth is knowledge and is supreme of all possession let us reflect redundant wealth a prospective job material gain are these the only reasons why we need education or does education have a higher purpose personal enrichment loyalty value self discipline citizenship before we find a slack in the education system let's analyze what we lack in ourselves do we really have that inner voice which ignites our mind and compels us to ask how when and why global economic collapse terrorism poverty child abuse education was meant to solve problems then did education itself become a problem exactly it became a problem when we changed the essence of education so how is education typically defined it is the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing applying analyzing and evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation experience and reflection or reasoning at the guide to belief and action isn't the first sounding today even the very meaning of education has become so mechanical and tedious education is simply about learning and creating new knowledge it means to question to form opinion based on one's own judgment as galileo once said you cannot teach a man anything you can only help him find it within himself for most of us education means going to a place called school where teachers and the church with their wisdom this mistaken idea of what true education is and how it can be achieved is is a root problem in mainstream education today the essence of education is the concentration of mind not the collection of facts the student insight is blocked by incessantly overburdening them with information life has become a bandwidth where a person's individuality has been crushed the students have become submissive and are giving in to the whims and fancies of the world where they are not accepted for who they really are be it by teachers parents or peers they are simply a, a shadow of the society's education system they have nothing of their own their creativity originality and intuition have become inconspicuous education has produced a vast population able to read but unable to distinguish what is worth reading we are not educating we are simply schooling we are made to obey Believe and follow. We hear, see, smell, see, and taste, but we don't. Training is only about developing skills. As a ring leader, trains the lion to act upon his orders by luring him with a piece of meat. Today's education system is no different, where students are being fed to the web of sleep.
uh, are you uh, still speaking? Busy. Yeah, are you still yeah. speaking? Because it seems to have muted. Uh, have we lost you, team? One. Yeah, I. We we can't. I can't hear her for the last. I, I can't hear them either. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I do. I do believe there is some sort of problem. We we'll look uh, into that right away. Uh, meanwhile, I like. I like what they've begun to say. You know, they're saying that we have uh, contorted the entire meaning of education by making it such a complex. Uh, you know, such a complex system when it's all simply just about learning and creating your knowledge. In fact, we've kept it so much about remembering what the past generations have learned that it's uh, it's no longer about creating anything new. No, no, we can't hear you. So you look at yes. can't hear them at all. Yes, and I think uh, you know somewhere we are. Uh, uh, you know, confusing education with just training, maybe, you know. And I think that's what they're trying to say. Uh, can, can we distinguish between education and training? Yes, Akshay. Yes. Yes, 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 ma'am. Ma can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so Akshay, who do you think is a better individual? A perfectly trained one or an educated one? Well, I think a perfectly trained individual is far better than a perfectly educated one. And why is that? Simple. It's only because he is the one who attains knowledge through instruction and develops skills for organizational gain. He has a trained mindset and he has and his actions are based on the influence of his teachers, peers, and superiors. Do you know who's an educated individual? No. An educated individual is the one who searches for excellence. He's independent within the constraints of li collaborative living in action and form. He has deep and genuine sense of empathy. A perfectly trained individual plays a passive role in learning and has a restricted mind and level of thinking. While an educated individual plays an active role in learning and he believes in thinking globally and acting locally. I would like to refute your point here. A perfectly trained individual might be playing a passive role in learning but he is program driven and he believes in performing his action on the basis of the knowledge that he requires. Since he has acquired his knowledge from reliable sources, his actions are bound to be fruitful. Unlike a self driven individual whose sources of knowledge might not be so reliable. Education is not just a matter of training the mind. Training makes for efficiency, but it does not bring about personal growth and completeness. Knowledge and efficiency are both necessary to bring about a holistic dimension to education. So it is about time we introspect. Are we trained individuals or educated ones? Today, education just emphasizes on theories instead of values, concepts rather than human beings, abstraction rather than consciousness, answers instead of questions, teaching a student that all knowledge is absolute, and giving him that truth on the silver platter shuts down the faculty of thought. Why think when the answer has already been given? The realization that we come to by exploring our world together with other people are still the most meaningful. Earth and sky, woods and fields, lakes and rivers, the mountains and the sea are excellent schoolmasters. And they teach some of us more than we can ever learn from books. Robinson Crusoe being one of the greatest examples of such a learner. It is erroneous if a student is taught lessons using fear as the basic motivation, fear of detention, fear of not surviving in the competitive world, and the fear of deadlines can hamper a student's holistic personality development. Motivation cannot be compared. Education has to stimulate this dominant motivation and most importantly, should help to sustain. Teaching should be such that what is offered is perceived as a valuable gift and not as hard duty. Never regard study as duty, but as the inviolable opportunity to learn. To know the liberating influence of beauty in the realm of the spirit for your own personal joy and to the profit of the community to which your work later belongs. The real lessons of life do not need to be remembered because they cannot be forgotten. Real learning has nothing to do with remembering things. That's what makes real learning a joyful, an awakening, and an empowering experience. Life is my school, 
Every scene is a workshop. My teachers all around me, and every interaction carries a potential lesson to be learned and discerned. It's about time we notice and treasure real learning. Thank you so much. Um, I think I think they hit the nail on the head there. They're just uh, they're also like it's it's interesting that you said that they were talking exactly about education versus training. I think that our civilization has this sort of arrogance where we've started to believe that we've learned everything that we need to learn, and so if our children simply understand what we know, they should be fine. And you know the even outside possibility of some child knowing more than we already do. Is absolutely ignored, don't you think? Absolutely. <laughs> and I think uh, as educators, we need to remember that more than anyone else. Yeah, exactly. Well, all right. So, so that, ma'am, was step one. Step one, define the problem. Step two of design thinking is to empathize, which means that they say that it is not just enough for you to want to solve a problem. For you to want to solve a problem the correct way, meet someone who is directly involved with that problem. And understand what his viewpoint is, and so then only can you come up with a holistic solution that fits right. And so that's what we ask team two to do. We ask them to go and study the outlook of various stakeholders in education. What do they want from education, and uh, are they justified in wanting that? So team two, are you ready? All right. So team two is ready. Yeah. Okay. Team 2, we can't hear you. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, we're ready. All right, great. Okay. Good morning. Um, I have never let my schooling interfere with my education. What exactly did Mark Twain mean by this? If one thinks about it, the most appealing definition of a school is an institution that teaches children in the most simplistic manner. Education, on the other hand, is the knowledge and development resulting from an educational process. As one perceives from the above mentioned, education is a broad term that gives knowledge, whereas schooling is just a venue providing education. Albert Einstein had once said, education is what is left after one has forgotten what one learned in school. Most educational institutions mistake memorizing for learning. That said, most of what is taught in classrooms is forgotten, and most of what is remembered is irrelevant. Borrowing Ken Robinson's words, one doesn't grow into creativity, one grows out of it. Or rather, one is educated out of it. Imagine a factory where the child is broken, melted and poured into a mold. A mold so cold and so strong that it metamorphosizes us. It metamorphosizes our identity. And the worst part, it forces thousands of young minds whose brains are wired differently to think in one single way. That said, has education started restraining us? Can it only ignite our minds and not our souls? The most common notion associated with learning today is does it guarantee us a good job? Does the idea of studying even pass beyond the realm of seeking a livelihood? Does the bus stop there? Is your education nothing more than a pathway to your career? Is it more important to be an emotionally stable person who can face the storm of life? Or is it more important to be a person with huge reserves of knowledge and yet be feeble-minded? Education is meant to be the biggest investment an individual makes in oneself. So what is the return that we are all looking for? Is education building our social status to escape society's cynicism? Is it turning us? into global leaders? Or is it making us more adaptable to the world around? We ask our society that comprises of students, teachers, parents, 
an employer. What is the purpose of education? Learning what to think or learning how to think? Some of us study to score, while some of us study to fulfill our parents' wishes. But the zealous and committed Damyanti Salanki had other plans. She was among the few who studied to learn, who studied to become a logical thinker, who studied to become independent. Damyanti is a 10th grade graduate. She was forced into an early marriage. She now has an unemployed son, unemployed husband and three daughters to support. She writes poems in her free time. Her love for books landed her a job in the housekeeping staff of Arun Kodar Library. She is determined to educate her daughters and this was the reason her spirits were never thwarted by any inhibiting factor. Keeping her as our role model, we would like to ask the society, should education provide us with financial independence or independence in thought? Seeing her passion for gaining knowledge, she was once asked if she wanted to continue her education. Damyanti's reply was a firm no. It is still date that Damyanti considers education to be just an extension to rote learning. In spite of having a chimerical memory of knowing the place of each book, she considers herself unfit of being able to cope with the present curriculum. Why does this notion still exist in our society? Dhirubhai Ambani struggled all his life to build his dream. What if, after all this hard work, Mukesh Ambani wanted to raise cars. The founder and frontman of India's biggest music band, Euphoria, Dr. Palas Singh's parents are successful doctors. And hence he was expected to become one himself. However, he harbored a, posh, a passion for music. He could deal with it systematically. He first qualified as an orthopedic surgeon and then pursued his passion. He excelled and made a radical change. But if we ask ourselves, how many Dr. Palas Saints have we heard about? What if Dr. Palas Saints hadn't made it big in the music industry? Is it wrong for a parent to secure his child's future at the cost of his passion? Well, that was an interesting video really. and a very good conversation. Um, yes. Oh, yes, some more. Yes. 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 People of various classes and strata of society have several of their own views on what good education means to them. We ask you, why should there be a good or bad, bad education? Why does this whole concept exist? Vijay Kopi. The Deputy General Manager of Vijayat Electrical hails from a family of vegetable vendors. An engineer by profession, he believes the current education system is responsible for where he stands today. He feels that while the system is not without its loopholes, it is sturdy enough for a determined student to succeed against all odds. Mr. Kopi says that the secret mantra for every man to prosper is a good education supported by hard work and perseverance. Can we question Mr. Vijay Kope's belief that education is meant to give us returns in terms of a good job? We believe that the purpose of education differs from person to person due to varying perceptions and mindsets. The 
different opinions of people from diverse sections of the society add to education's manifold dimension. One may feel education is necessary for financial support, whereas others may just consider it another phase of life. Well, we leave you to ponder over this question with a broadening perspective. As Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to entertain a thought without accepting it. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I think, uh, you know, education has some problems also because we're not getting maybe the right people into the education profession. And I think uh, that's a perspective which, um, as educators, we all uh, uh, share. But when we spoke to the children and we asked them, why is it that the youth is not looking at teaching as a profession? Uh, they had some interesting perspectives uh, and, and they have some thoughts on how maybe perhaps education and teaching could be made more aspirational and perhaps we need to rebrand education, education yeah, and teaching. Definitely. We would be remiss if, if while empathizing we didn't study the crux of the education system which is that is the mindset of teachers and potential teachers. In fact, uh, we had a team that, that studied that. So, are you ready? Yeah, we're ready. So we like to continue where we left off. So reform and progress in education is perhaps the most important policy issue in our nation today. The otherwise, we may soon realize that the much touted demographic dividend of our nation is nothing but an illusion as we are left with groups of unemployable youth unable to join the workforce. So what is the demographic dividend that we are talking about? The age groups 0 to 6 years form 13.4% of a population. The age groups 7 to 14 years form 19.4% of a population. And the age groups 15 to 59 years form 57% of a population. The youth is the demographic dividend of our nation. And we need to exploit this in order to achieve a better position. To achieve a better position, quality education is needed. Quality education is required to mobilize these young minds and enable them to think better, to be, to be a part of our progress. But to make our reforms reach every corner of our nation, what we really require is quality educators. Our government schools, especially those in the rural areas, paint a very sorry picture of our education system today. We lack in both quality and quantity when it comes to teachers. India ranks very poorly when we compare student-teacher ratios from countries across the globe. The only inference? We just don't have enough teachers to teach our large student population. Even when we do have teachers, the government-sponsored probe report, which was undertaken in four, four states, made startling discoveries. In about half the schools they visited, no apparent teaching activity was taking place. One in four teachers in a government school was absent on a given day, and only one in two was actually teaching. There is no system in place to motivate our teachers to improve the academic achievements of their students, and no resources available for them to hone their skills and develop better teaching techniques. Why is it that we cannot produce quality teachers? Why is teaching no longer considered a viable career option? Why are our educators no longer enjoying the exalted position they once enjoyed in society? And this I find rather ironical because our culture and our stratification system always venerated the Brahmin caste which was engaged in imparting education. The honor and respect that we bestow on our quintessential gurus has eroded in recent times. When we rebrand a product, you rebrand a product when you want to reposition it in the market. You rebrand a product when you want to revalue re it and increase its demand. We rebrand a product when you want to revive its failing fortune. We need to make teaching a career prospect, a, pro uh, a very interesting and uh, a very interesting and lucrative career prospect. Teaching has to be rebranded. Re 
being an educator should be something that people aspire for. People probably say, Mera beta engineer banega, Mera beta doctor banega. We should reach a time when people say, Nahi, Mera beta teacher banega. We need to position teaching in such a way that society looks up to it as a profession which is respectable enough to work for. Man works when there is an incentive, plain and simple. You want more people to come and teach? Provide some incentive. Make sure your teachers are paid well and regularly. If this means that the government has to spend a much higher amount on education, then so be it. It has to be done because money is probably the most effective way of providing incentive. Salaries must be reviewed periodically and certain essential facilities like nearby accommodation, inclusion of health and retirement benefits should also be a part of the package. It is necessary to improve promotional prospects in order to attract and retain talent. Promotions should directly be linked to your performance as a teacher just like all other corporate jobs. Qualified and trained teachers in primary schools must be considered for promotion as a headmaster or inspector of school. Glorify teaching. Instill a sense of pride among teachers by highlighting the role they play in laying the foundation and building blocks for the development of our country. Now, this is something Teach for India has been doing very successfully. Yeah. Acknowledge teachers. National awards must be given to identify and acknowledge extraordinary work done in this field. Media can play an instrumental role over here. We need more shows like CNN, IBN, India Positive, which can showcase exemplary work done by teachers from different parts of our country so that they feel recognized. And just this much can certainly go a long way. Many believe that the quality of education in our country is poor because our educators are not trained in the right field. For instance, the mandatory BL course tests you more on facts and how much you already know rather than the important skills one requires for teaching. Moreover, teachers must be required to complete a specified amount of research work or a certain number of courses for professional development. These courses should be facilitated by the government so that the teachers, especially from the rural areas, don't have to spend too much from their own pocket. Um, have we lost you or are you still online? And they seem to be frozen. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you just check that and maybe yep. think they try no, to but round up. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That was uh, rather exciting. In fact, uh, it's nice to know that these students have, um, you know, if you want to know the seed that these thoughts germinated from, they were talking to me the other, the other day and what they said was, there is an in IAS and there is an IPS and these are such uh, aspirational jobs there should be an ITS yes. in an in in Indian teaching service and um, and they said so you know we need to rebrand education to make it to turn it on its head and make it something so that it's not the last dog at the bowl so that real good talent is first attracted to the education sector and then to the others and uh, it's exciting to hear that they had such practical viewpoints on it they've, they've studied uh, you know, not just high and mighty ideas, but also, uh, you know, pay the teachers better, pay them on time. Practical, pragmatic yes, and, solutions. And yes. also the high and mighty ones where you make, uh, you make teaching, uh, are you back online? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? I think we should let them finish, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So, after the training. The, yes, yes. We heard Varun last. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, our policy makers need to realize that there is a problem. They need to realize that changes are long due. But at the same time, expecting a sudden overhaul in our system all too quickly would seem a bit foolhardy on our part. 
The change must be gradual. The change must be sustained. As we live in global times, it's become my So we lost you again uh, temporarily. Uh, we could have Dr. Sujatas. Yes. Um, Line? Rowan? All right. Uh, yes. Um. Yes. Dr. Sujata. Uh, any thoughts at this point of time that you'd like to share since uh, you know they're just trying to fix their net? It's difficult to disagree with anything that uh, the students are saying. Um, I have a few uh, pointers, I mean, not pointers, I mean, uh, so the first thing is when did it become a problem? Personally, I feel that we have now made education mainstream, you know, I mean, it was always a problem, but the numbers were small and we didn't see it. Today the numbers are large and therefore we see it. That's one. Second, it's not a problem that's unique to India. The world over, you know, people are grappling with what is the then, then third, uh, I feel I feel that you know when we talk about education and the schools, parents, families, society, all of this had a role to play in education earlier and people in those sectors have just abdicated their responsibility as far as teaching values or teaching other aspects of education that society wants to revere. You know, as far as imparting them to the children, I think people have abdicated roles and all that should come back as well. You know, school is not the only place where you can impart knowledge or where you can impart values. We should come back to a stage where this is a continuous process. Students absorb it from the media, from the family, from their neighbors, where it's today. You know, we have, what are the role, role models that uh, television is projecting or is projecting? I have no problems. I have no problems with uh, the role models that they are projecting. But it is solely of one kind. You know, the other, why don't we celebrate Palash Sain much more? Why doesn't the media make him a hero? You know? Why doesn't the media make a hero of so many others who have, Damiyanti, uh, uh, for instance, who have just... Yeah walk away from what would have been their path and done something. You know, these are small stories, but these are stories which are worth uh, publicizing and people, one way or the other, will get inspired by them. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, the whole societal uh, mindset has to, uh, you know, uh, maybe change. I mean, why is it that we hold only the, uh, you know, the education, educators and the schools responsible for education? I agree with you there. Because uh, somewhere, you know, we're finding that parents feel uh, once the children are in school, they will get educated and, and their responsibility is over, you know. For instance, I would like to see all the students who put up such fantastic presentations, be mentors, yeah. talk to other younger students about what they do is right or, you know. It's a very yeah. important role that they can play. And then they talk to the younger students about what else they yes. can do different, and why they should be doing something different and so on, you know. They can talk yeah. about it on yeah. social networks, they can post, they can blog, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that that's a very good suggestion. And to some extent, you know, we've done it in our school. We've created this um, a group called Dishtikon Group, where, uh, you know, we have people, we have um, from uh, across uh, ages, you know. And, and, you know, they are sharing their views on, and there's uh, younger children, there are older children, their parents, there are... Um, you know, people from society. So everybody's sharing perspectives, and I think somewhere we're trying to change the, the the status quo from you know what it is, trying to build that perspective a little uh, a wider outlook to issues. Because you know what we find is that uh, there was a time when we used to tell our children watch the news or read the newspaper, and, and so today we find that they consume a lot of news, but to form a balanced opinion and a view which is, you know, which, which they can support it. They, they're just kind of uh, reciting it and, uh, and narrating it verbatim. Yeah, so, so forming opinions and, and being able to convince us with those, you know, and balance opinions and, and a, you know, a, a well thought out uh, decision rather than just what everybody's saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it feels like just like education, even media today, ma'am, 
has just begun about has become about you know projecting viewpoints directly into your head you know uh, rather than just you know narrating facts and asking you to form your own viewpoints and so we really felt this need to have an all year round uh, you know space yes forum for for students to continuously be giving their own viewpoints and we really encourage that and yeah. it's it's given good results we really. yeah and, and you know i mean uh, i think raj yeah, so you go on. Yeah, they're back on it. Yeah. Yeah. Are they back? Uh, no, we just. Yes, uh, Rohan, are you back, back online? Uh, we are back online. Yeah. I, okay, okay. Still, where did you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rohan, you, you were telling us about how the policy makers need to make a change. Uh, so, what I was trying to say is that they need, when we are asking for change, but we don't want to change, I mean, we don't want to complete overall very suddenly because that's going to create a lot more problems. At least that's what I feel. So what we really need is a gradual change, but a sustained change. So since we live in global times, it's mandatory for us to rid our system of the parochial outlook it's long been entrenched in. And the answer that our youth really seeks is certitude. And the youth deserves it. That's that's what we're trying to say. All right, thank you. So I think uh, between the first team that was studying the outlooks of various uh, stakeholders, between team two, which is speaking of uh, the teachers, and of course Dr. Sujata Ma'am, who spoke about the pertinent point of how education no longer projects any values or you know helps with that sort of value education. Uh, I think we've got a, a good, uh, complete idea of the problem because, you know, as as Team Two was saying, if we only study education from a from a career oriented point of view, then we lose the plot. We we kill creativity and any chance of innovation. If we look at education strictly from an academic point of view, from a high and mighty point of view, then we deny people a way up in life because education is that opportunity, that ladder for the have-nots to come at par with the haves and yeah. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If somebody wants education to better his position in life, I I don't see how we could argue with that. Yeah. And so we are looking and of course the point where we absolutely ignore values altogether. So put all those together and we've got a well-defined problem I believe. So we move to step three. And uh, step three is brainstorming, where you come up with all possible uh, alternatives using all all sorts of lateral thinking. You come up with all possible alternatives to how the solution can can be found, and that's what we asked of Team Four. Uh, quite a tough task. And uh, Team Four, are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, go. So basically, um, yesterday we were brainstorming on the issue and we think of possible solutions. So we'd like to you know, share a video of us brainstorming yesterday. So Ajit sir. Yes, 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 definitely. So they sent us the video in, uh, we'll just screen share that with you. Um, uh, Ajit, sorry to interrupt briefly. Since we don't know the names of the students in the teams, okay. maybe you can yes. just tell their names at the very yes. beginning. Yes, yes sir, uh, definitely sir. So who who you see right now are Akash, uh, uh -huh. who's in, in the, the center, center. Balash, uh -huh. screen left, and screen right is Dave. Uh, Pasham, screen left. And in fact, later on, as I type on the side, it will be good if you could just post the names and also the text. Yes, 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 yes ma'am. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. This is just a point that I made earlier that you should post the names of the students who participated in the different teams. Yes, definitely. We'll do that. We'll once, tag we, once this video is on YouTube, we will definitely tag, and if possible, we will even caption what they're saying where it's not clear enough. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Right. So what do we call that like one person instead of high school experience? Good. Yeah. So now, this is a period of life that's supposed to be fun, entertaining, and learning. So this is actually did away with schools. And actually, just let us move this to the greatest parts of knowledge. What do you think? You know, believe it or not, but actually. This type of education system already exists in some places. This was a non intrusive method of education. So the student learns by exploring and experimenting. Have you heard of the whole new world project? No, exactly. No. Well, I'll sum it up for you in a short brief space. It's basically that a person went to a village and put a computer and left it, uh, and just left it there. And over a period of 
prime students went to the computer, exploded, experimented, and they learned. So no manuals, no teachers, no tests, no training, and no service even. And still the students learn. That's amazing. You know, it's really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. Do we even need our education system? The teachers, the current the degrees, anything at all. So from there is in fact this plan of education, these pioneers, they've started these schools such as studio schools. Right? You actually learn on the job. Now you cannot actually argue with the experience, the whole kind of responsibility and discipline that you get to do. Yeah, I think that would even solve the problem about how expensive education is today. Because you would actually get paid for what you're doing. So then that brings the education to the average person. But then what about the younger students? Because you can't really tell a younger student to work. So over there we could try to voice out the approach. Well, I think there is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and the testing is only a practical effect. Well, I'm glad, but there is more room, there is more things that need to be done. For example, there is something like policy. I can't feel that even though there is self-learning self that has been applied, there is a very big need of a guide in that. For example, our current education system might be a very good uh, placement, but it can be very pressurizing. So we need something more subtle. Yes, so maybe we need tests, we need a curriculum, we need to keep the learners on track. But students remain just as motivated, even in structured learning, as long as the education is experiential. There are some schools which teach everything through practical learning. They don't even have textbooks, and students respond with this kind of teaching. Always, always knowing what you're studying means no subject is boring. Plus, there's no road learning here. Yeah, because I think experience should be a part of whatever you're learning. But then it's sad that what kind of road learning does to our education system. But then, would it be a type of school to do it? It's expensive. Oh yes, it is. It's, already, it is not, it's not feasible and cannot be applied to all different areas or different curriculums. Or for that matter, all subjects. In some subjects, learning simply doesn't fit into the classroom application. Not unless we completely simplify the content. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to explain what is a complete not exactly written content. Now there is this new concept, I'm going to turn you up. It's called the MOOC. It's a very big read in that moment. Now, it is online courses which a person can actually access with just a click on it. It's very exciting. Now, it is accessible, inexpensive. And actually solve the problem of education disparity and the lack of efficient teachers. You know, of course, that's very exciting, no doubt. But and probably it must be flawless in a way, but what do you do if the student can't catch up? Or what do you do if you have a team motivated student? Well now that brings us to a conundrum. We say we keep a structure, we keep testing, we keep syllabus and we keep a textbook. But then that restrains the right mind. But then if we leave the learning open, the people motivated the student needs to be provided with that spark so he goes out there and actually learns. So basically we need something like a one size fits all. You know, throughout my life I've always had a teacher write me. So I think that's where the teacher comes in. You always need a human interface. Absolutely. But I think the teacher needs to be more aware of his role now. Like the teacher needs to be able to take a back seat and let the child learn when he's already learning and then sometimes provide the gentle push or the guidance so the child gets stuck. Exactly. The teacher also needs to make sure that he leaves the back photo and takes them further into what they're learning. So the teacher does not really need to be a taskmaster like what he is currently, but he needs to be more of a better teacher. The teacher needs to bring that subjectivity and that flow into what the students are learning. So to sum it up, I think we recommend schools, textbooks, exams, and teachers. But isn't that where we already are? But I can't help but think that yes, we are already making some progress. So basically, if we sum it up, we don't need to exactly do away with textbooks, teachers, or our institutions. But what the designers of education need to keep in mind are these ideals. These ideals of number one, experiential learning. Number two, flexible education. And number three, 
future health facilitator. Absolutely. Uh, also, I think that the, the education you receive needs to be more self-paced. So, self-paced not, self, not only self-paced, but also self-driven. Self-paced and self-driven. Akash, that's this point also. We need a blend of practical and abstract learning. So I think basically that's what we feel are the drawbacks in the current education system and, and we need to work on how we can go about trying to improve it. Right. That's all folks. Mm -hmm. Alright. Uh, so with these still on your screen, um, so these are these are the these are the solutions offered by our students then. Experiential learning. Uh, but what they say then about that is that it should not just be practical or just abstract. It should be a blend of both those things because too much abstraction makes people lose the plot. But sometimes too much practicality also does the same thing because they know how to do it. They just don't know why. Um, but I think the, the key point there would be the word blend. You know, everything they say speaks of removing the rigidity from education but while still offering practical solutions as to how that can be done. Uh, you know, by, by bringing in the teacher to fulfill that role. The teacher comes in to take rigidity out. Whenever the child needs it, the teacher provides the push. And when the child no longer requires it, the teacher takes a back seat. I think we, they did a good job of finding that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, right. So then the next step, and this is the final step usually. I think I'd just like yeah. to add here that, you know, uh, we're talking about the, the importance of the teacher as a as a as a guide, as a mentor, uh, not a sage on stage. Uh, so uh, I think the next thing that we now need to look at is perhaps um, the the role of technology and how has technology, uh, you know, brought a different dimension to education? Has it removed somewhere uh, the human element from uh, education? And I think the next team that is going to come up is going to talk about technology and whether uh, technology has fulfilled its promise or whether there we have a, a lot of unfulfilled promises from technology. We, we uh, put a high stake on technology, uh, whether it has really fulfilled it. And so they have something to say, but they they requested that I share this video with them first, with you first. So this is uh, what they have been showing. Yeah. What does the future of learning look like, and how do we create it? When we think about the future, we usually look to two things: dreaming or dreading. When we dream. We start with an idea, a positive trend, and take the idea to its logical conclusion. We imagine a utopia that represents our hopes for that's possible. Maybe that idea is the promise of technology to transform learning. What would that look like? We might dream of being able to assess each student's need and then magically give them exactly what they need exactly when they need it. But this is impossibly perfect and simplistic, ignoring the complexities of the learning process. When we dread, we start the fear, a downward trend, and we likewise play out this idea to its logical conclusion. We imagine a dystopia, one filled with fear of what might happen in the future. Here, the very same issue of use of technology in the classroom might wear off in a completely wrong direction with dreadful outcomes. Kids trapped in a matrix of robotic construction. Of course, this is equally simplistic and ignores technology's potential. Dreaming and dreading are not our only options. Somewhere in between is a third path, followed by a few. The third and a rather uncanny approach is designing. Designing puts the future in our hands, in our control. With designing, we can incorporate values of several systems in order to create a model one. Thus, working towards elevating the problems of technology, we integrate the qualities to make one close to ideal system as the answer to all our fears and the foundation for all our ideas. On the road of development of an individual, 
from a child to an adult education plays a key role technology can help technology can help such an individual in learning how to learn education is a system invented to develop students in a holistic manner and help them progress in life earlier there were three main sectors for students after school factory farms and universities casualties in the form of dropouts were observed this system provided moderate wages as economic times changed farm jobs diminished offices were introduced and university graduates were at a benefit now college became the main path to jobs in offices there was a direct road from school to offices however as the jobs became more demanding this road also vanished thus forces of students were created who were unable to garner success and became futile for the nation the system remains broken even with the arrival of technology to understand how it is broken we need to look inside we see a system of six parts which creates a student's experience first what they learn how they learn and how we know they are learning and also when and where learning happens and who's involved how we configure these parts determines how kids move in the learning process more often than not these parts form rigid barriers blocking the way forward or sending them on the wrong path various innovators have focused on adjusting one or more of these parts to help the kids move forward this is an important progress but this approach is not the way forward what we need is learning integrated by design addressing all parts at once rather than one or two in isolation when we get this right we make it possible for kids to accelerate their learning to move forward in the direction they want to go a model learning system should be personalized learner driven applied cost effective and most importantly tech enabled all right uh, anshuta are you online yes sir all right good afternoon right. yeah yeah good afternoon i'm anshuta and from this video we can believe that technology is the best solution for us although recently when a smartphone was launched in the market a joke was found doing the rounds on the internet how does it feel to have a phone smarter than you and even though this probably meant as a joke it is possible that this is true the way we define smartness or knowledge today is recollection of facts quick recall of memorized events and formulae accurate calculation reporting opinion Our phones aren't smarter than us, or are they? It is a good question to ponder on, because it reminds those who may have forgotten that the superiority of human lies in their interpretation, application, and creation of knowledge, rather than the simple store and recall function. There probably was a time when humans needed to retain these facts and information. in order to be able to use it but with the advent of the internet smartphones and various other it products this information is more readily and reliably available at all times to the user that means that the human no longer needs to retain this in his brain therefore continuing to teach in a traditional manner ignoring technology and insisting that students continue to retain this information in their brain is as redundant as training them to live and have a taste so this is what we propose using technology in education does not require a computer in a classroom or any expenditure at all it requires us to rethink our education system we must remember that students no longer need to retain this large amount of information and provide them with formula sheets text etc during their test thereby testing only Yet interpretation and analytical skills. This is what technology can offer to us: freedom from memory-based learning without spending a dime. Thank you. 
Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Anshruta. That, that would be perfect. I, I absolutely love what you said there about how uh, ignoring technology and its promises for memory recall and uh, computation would be like uh, asking and teaching people how to inhabit caves. <laughs> well, um, so that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to make a cross-sectional study of the problems of education and preferably suggest solutions. And the solutions that our students promised, I mean, um, prescribed are that we make our education a lot more flexible and of course that we stop we stop focusing so much on rote learning because now the technology is here that that is no longer necessary so cost effective methods of uh, improving the problems of, of education but uh, but something interesting happened when we when we first announced our topic when we first said that uh, education was supposed to offer solutions when did it become the problem we intended that our students would think about what are the problems of education but something very interesting happened as, as an offshoot a lot of students in our school started to focus on the part where education was supposed to offer solution and so we had Harshit uh, whom you saw earlier today discussing how we can rebrand education he came up with an idea of of a combustion combustion engine that actually reduces emission by a whole lot uh, we look forward to having that paper up very soon on our Drishtikon page. We also had some students that got together and uh, used Henry Fayol's principles of order in management and uh, labeled the uh, switchboards of our entire school so that nobody was now uh, trying the trial and error method to find out which appliance is connected to which switch. And uh, all this in just two weeks of thinking. And so we have some, we have. Uh, one team like that today that uh, applied mathematics, economics, and God knows what else to the ideas of uh, to the problem of traffic flow. Uh, Abhijay and Nomer, are you ready? Yes, yes, we are. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, All right. Then. Uh, this is our last team, uh, Doctor Sujata, Doctor Rajesh. This is our last team. Uh, okay. Over to you, Abhijay and Nomer. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Abhijay. I'm Nomer. Yeah, hi. Hi. Okay. So, should we begin? Step out yeah, on the road. Forward. Step out on the road, and you are hit by the chaos and, and confusion, mm -hmm. which is an integral part of the Indian roads. Be your preferred mode of transport, a very Ferrari, or a clicky clacky bullock car. You simply cannot go faster than the vehicle chugging along in front of you. Traffic snarls are a common man's conundrum. From the billionaire in Edison, the slum dweller in Shanty, traffic jams paint all to the same brush. And in fact, as I stepped out of school two weeks ago, I saw a dire state of traffic right outside. I thought to myself, I only need someone to solve this puzzle. And that's when it hit me. That for one year, I had been staring at, no, living in, a real life problem of living with the fact that I had already been equipped in necessary skills to take on the problem by its own. Using everyday qualitative and quantitative skills picked up during our course, we have developed a mathematical model to optimize vehicular flow among roads. We have tried to create solutions which are not capital intensive and can thus be stitched into existing systems without a hitch. A teacher once told me, when studying something, ask why multiple times. It will feel like a game, but will reinforce your concepts as you question the rules. Let's try that out. We want to deal with traffic and want to optimize vehicular flow. Why? To reduce transport time and reduce stress. Why? To make travel efficient and to improve mental well-being. We now know the root cause of this problem and why our solution is pertinent to societal welfare. Another important question is how. Knowing why a problem exists is essential. However, without knowledge of how a problem came into existence and how to solve it, one's knowledge is incomplete. Just like Yin and Yang, Laurel and Hardy, these two burning questions are entwined and inseparable. 
The first idea which came to mind to ease congestion on roads is to well build more roads. It may seem to make sense, but that's not the case. Economists Waldrop and Nash came up with Waldrop's principle of equilibrium and Nash's equilibrium, which have profound application in number theory, game theory, and combined college. As you can see in this example, on removal of path B to C, average travel time per, com per commuter decreases. This counterintuitive behavior is known as brace paradox for resource allocation. As you can see, the solution to tra traffic problems is not simple, else it would have been tied up in a knot a long time ago. These concepts are some of the pillars on which our model rests. For roads less than 350 meters, another theory is needed to explain traffic flow. Take a road with a signal at the end. The moment the signal turns green, the car in the front row doesn't move. Because of the delay in the first row of cars, there is a delay in the second row. This delay keeps increasing as we move back to the extent that the last three rows of cars are unaffected. This time delay resembles a geometric progression to a formal ratio less than 1. However, if we have the signal turn yellow instead of directly turning from red to green, the time delay for the first car tends to zero. The time delay for the first car tends to zero. The sum of the entire geometric progression tends to zero. Every term of, of a geometric progression is a multiple of a first term. The lot of zeros still add up to zero. Also, if we have a pothole or some other deformity on the road, it slows down the flow of traffic and all this can be predicted with reasonable accuracy using basic equations of motion. In fact, we were able to prove that a car can slow down to a factor of, its, of the distance of the pothole divided by the length of, its, length of the car. Using basic trigonometry, we found the optimal height to place a signal at. The human eye has a vision range of 60 degrees in the upward direction. A comfortable angle for the human eye to perceive is 30 degrees. If the ratio of the height of the signal to the length of the road is 1 is to root 3, the person at the back of the road will also be able to see the signal and react faster. We had a lot of fun coming up with this model. We integrated the topics that we learned in our coursework into this project. This made the work enjoyable instead of giving it the feel of a chore. We have gained much insight into the real world application of education. In these past two weeks, we have learned more through hands out experience than we have in two years. Exactly. In fact, that's the way learning should happen. That's the system which should be in place. A liberal system where thoughts are not bridled but allowed to run free but the limits of what can be attained are only one's imagination. It's what every child knows and what every adult has forgotten. Some believe that it's the system we deserve, just not the one we need right now. So we pass on the mantle of upheaval to the next generation. I ask you, when is it convenient to slip out of this rot? I say, be not passive party, but the potter who shapes the clay. Instead of waiting for change, be the change. Uh, the waves of change are striking the shores of our reality, and we can ride them or be swept away. Uh, uh, thank you, Abhijay Numer. I request you to stay online with us. Abhijay? Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Yes, yeah. So, uh, Rajesh um, and Sujata, uh, these two students have prepared a paper which I, uh, you know, shared with Sujata yesterday. Uh, yeah. This is an amateur effort, but they have tried to use their knowledge of mathematics and economics and computer science. Sure, it's um, very interesting. You know, I, I yeah. definitely looked at it early in the week. And yes, also yes. Send them a few other uh, links where. You know, these problems have been considered using game theory and so on. I'm sure it will inspire them. And uh, in fact, yes. at UBC, oh, we I have some people who are doing this very exciting about you know mathematics and human behavior. 
So I'm yeah. sure since they are interested uh, in such things, I just point to those sites, and I'm sure they'll enjoy it. Yeah, uh, absolutely, ma'am. I can tell you that they will because, uh, in fact, what they have been doing over the past two weeks is something that uh, we, we, you know, we, we are very reassured when we see, because you know, for example, Abhijay, he went to five uh, or six, you know, important function uh, like junctions in our in our city, and he went and actually counted cars to be able to understand what is the kind of flow that you expect, what are the problems, and. You know, when we when we see something like that, when students on their own can take that kind of effort for something which is extracurricular, you know, uh, we feel like we're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I, I somehow feel that uh, our education. Ma'am, would you have any questions? Sorry. Sorry, ma'am. No, I was just saying that one of the drawbacks of our education system in the last three decades has been that it has completely stunted these aspects of uh, children going out and doing things and learning from them. You know, I'm so glad to see it coming back. And see it I have great faith in our youth. And this is something I was telling earlier and I'm sure Rajesh will agree with me. You know, the few interactions we have had with youngsters on piano gives me tremendous optimism. You know, we have so many people out there and we just need to let them express and be a part of some excitement. They're just raring to go. And we are holding them back. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is something that resonates so strongly with me. Because uh, I always believe that, you know, we feel, we don't trust uh, our children so much that, you know, they can think and they can do something. So we don't stretch the envelope with them. And, and that's something that we, uh, you know, I think uh, Shaheen has done it with Teach for India. Uh, you know, uh, reposing our trust and our faith and having, and, and, I mean, you know, I'm sure that they will rise to the occasion, but we need to give them that uh, assurance and that trust. So let me, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, Rajesh. Um, yes. No, I was just saying a couple of things for the students, yeah. for the, um, you know, yes. uh, we, we as in uh, friends of mine and I, we have a, a an initiative that we call public problem solving. So the idea is to address problems that are important for people living in a city. So it could be traffic, it could be uh, garbage, it could be any of those things. So, so it's great to see that you guys have uh, tried to uh, convert that into a mathematical model. Now the challenge I would post to you is that especially for something like traffic, how do you turn a mathematical model, how do you make it more robust? So, you know, your, your model has certain assumptions. Uh, so, for example, you use the geometric series. Now, you have to tell me that if it is not a geometric series exactly, but something slightly different, the model still makes the predictions that you wanted. So, for example, uh, if the traffic, if the roads are broadened, how do you show that for a while traffic flow becomes smoother, but then it uh, gets actually more clogged? And and by the way, you should uh, you should Abhijay, also. Do you answer that now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, in fact, in, while while you are searching for this uh, topic, we found various things. What we are talking about is a, a moving bottleneck, essentially, until you get formed, mm -hmm. where one lane may end up becoming a truck and slow down the traffic to left lane. So these are all the things if you wanted to do. We base the model on certain assumptions and then slowly one after one after the other we take out yeah, the assumption. We will take out each uh, assumption and expand the model to something mm -hmm. that uh, is very close to the real world. Okay. Uh, let me also ask you another question since uh, I'll play the role of the quiz master here. <laughs> yeah, no, we want uh, you to. <laughs> right. Uh, you, uh, so uh, you must have heard of Bernoulli's principle, right? Yeah, but but this so so in fluid mechanics, if you have an in, uh, if you make a pipe narrow as you all do when we use faucets, the the speed of the water that comes out becomes faster. But in traffic, it's the exact opposite. So what's the difference? So why why is it that water flows out faster while traffic uh, gets slower when you get a bottleneck? Uh, yeah, uh, the thing still is that, as such, from uh, what I understand, of, from what uh, fluid flow, the, the orientation of the molecules, as such, when you decrease the, the uh, whatever the size of the faucet, they can still come close to each other comfortably and align them very close, 
such that the intermolecular distances will be very small. When you have big objects like trucks and cars, they can't really come that close. They actually, in fact, they're not even close to each other. So people actually fight about who will get into the lane first. You're right. You could probably constrict the lane, but uh, yeah, just because you have a you have cars and trucks, they can't really align themselves the way water molecules do because they uh, the orientation is very different, and that can't really be applied to a to traffic. So, uh, good answer, but let me just give you a more abstract way of stating the same answer, uh, which is that, you know, um, fluid, uh, at least water, we model it as incompressible, right, which means that uh, it's due to the law of conservation of mass that you have uh, the velocity being doubled when you constrict the uh, diameter by by half, right, but on the, uh, so you, so, of course, for traffic, there is no such thing as the law of conservation of mass. So, so you can't have the same amount of uh, traffic in half the volume as you would in the full volume. So, so it, so it turns out that actually good physical principles allow you to reason abstractly about these kinds of things as well. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, so, uh, and uh, any more questions for Abhijay and Nomad? No, uh, not from me. Uh, no, and, and uh, Amita, I really think that Sky should leave. Maybe Rajesh can stay for a few more minutes if that's possible. But I let me. I just want to say that it's been a tremendous experience. I want to congratulate all the students for putting up such a fantastic show. And I wish I could have stayed longer. And I look forward to such uh, you know hangouts or something in the future. I'd be very happy to interact and discuss them. Yeah. Thank you so much, really Sitaka, for sparing your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhijay and Nomad. Yes, yes. Thank all the yes, students. They did a great job. And, no, I just see I'm I just sure think that the students did a great job. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, ma'am. The problems are not. Yes. Thank you. So I will exit thank now. You. Thank, you taking, uh, thank you for taking your time out to talk to all. Not at all. My pleasure. It's been my pleasure. See you all. Thanks. And, and congratulations to you, Amita, and also Ajit. You did a great job comparing. And to Sham, the thank man behind so the scenes who does. Yes. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to you. <laughs> right. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Ajit. Uh, uh, Rajesh, would you like to maybe, uh, uh, you know, kind of give some concluding impressions? Uh... Okay, so um, uh, let me start with some bad news. Uh, when yeah. I, so I, I there, there's a very prominent school in Delhi that I joined in class seven. Uh, I, I won't name the name, but you know, it's a school that is now in pretty much every city in India. Uh, so, so you can guess which one it is. Um, so the first day I went to seventh class, and my Hindi teacher, who also will not be named, slapped me on my face because I had not done my homework. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, it's my first day in school. How could I have done the homework? But clearly the, she was not impressed by that uh, reasoning. <laughs> so I, I, I do hope that that model of education is seeing its last days in India. And it's great to see uh, children actually being the leaders in this process. You know, I, I mean, I, I still, my inner child is not that far away, but, but I recognize that I'm not a kid anymore. Uh, but it's absolutely fantastic to see that children are taking the initiative, are doing research, uh, inquiring into real questions, not fake questions, and, and presenting their findings in public. So these are the skills that will be useful in the 21st century, not, not the ability to mug up uh, answers and regurgitate them in exams. So I, I'm really happy that uh, uh, Drishtikon is enabling that kind of inquiry. Thank you so much, uh, Rajesh. And uh, I think we'll just maybe get the audience once on screen. Can you all? Uh -huh. uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, you've been a great audience. Uh, uh, 
um, I don't know whether we'll be able to get a question from you, but I'm sure you'll have lots of questions to ask your children. And I'm sure you're very proud of uh, parents and teachers there. Uh, I'm sure you're very proud of uh, your wards. They've done a splendid job of, you know, uh, being on the Hangout is their first time. And uh, mm -hmm. Rajesh, if I come back to you, uh, you know, we, we had butterflies this morning. We, we couldn't even do a run through, a proper run through before this. And you know, uh, you know how schools work? Uh, they never mm -hmm. put up a show without a run through. And uh -huh. this is the first time they've been, uh, you know, exposed to this medium. Uh, uh -huh. I told them that, um, you know, uh, in times to come, you may be giving interviews over Skype or maybe Google mm -hmm. Hangout. So you need to develop those skills on how to be, how to present and how to make an impact on the screen on through social media. So that's uh, another reason we thought um, this would be a good experiment to try out. Of course, we mm -hmm. were banking a lot on um, the internet speed, which has mm -hmm. helped us. Um, and your cooperation. Has, and yours, yes. Yes, oh my God. And, to take our time from your busy schedules and just listen in for us. Uh, bear with us when we had uh, those technical glitches. We, we can't thank you enough for all that, Doctor. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great pleasure. One suggestion I have is if there are questions, yes. uh, maybe you can yeah. just aggregate those questions and share them and see, you know, we can easily create a site where... Uh, no, definitely. Uh, we want to continue this discussion. In fact, I was yeah. just about to suggest that or, or for everybody listening and even for those that will watch this later on YouTube, um, you sh this discussion should not end here because then we have absolutely polluted the idea of taking learning beyond the classroom. So mm -hmm. this discussion should continue rightfully on our Drishtikon page, on Beer Mam's uh, Facebook page and any everywhere else. Uh, yeah. So we would invite you to that page. I believe you are already a part there. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe uh, Rajesh, uh, can we also put the link on Gyanom page with your permission? We have. I have put the YouTube link already. Oh, you have. Okay. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already been done. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's what I'm saying. That if we yes. see the questions and we, yes. I, I think that especially science or uh, sort of knowledge-related questions, it will be interesting yes. to get answers from everywhere else in the world as well, and not just uh, from yes. from us. Yes. So it will yes. be fantastic. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much Rajesh, and thank you, everyone, uh, the participants and the audience. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, ma'am. You've done a great job. Uh, just to add one last bit, Ajit used to be a student a few years ago. And the fact that he has come back to his alma mater and to share and to give back to the school, I think, speaks a lot. Um, he, he's by far the most popular teacher around. And um, mm -hmm. doing great job. I mean, we talked about the youths coming back and being, you know, making uh, education attractive for the youth. And I think he's come back, and that's a great reassurance for all of us. I think, ma'am, if if I may say so, the most important theme for Drishtikon today, for, for me, the most important takeaway has been the word optimism. There is so much wrong with the world today. There is so much wrong in almost every respect of how humans live with each other and alone uh, that it's often quite disconcerting you know you often feel like giving up but when you come to the education sector these are when you deal with these minds these are minds that have not learned to give up yet these are minds that have not been corrupted with the way we adults think yet and so if there is any chance of an overhaul of a reform of any chance of a u-turn I believe that it is here and uh, mm -hmm. When, when I am with children, when I am with people of this age, these minds, I feel optimistic. And so on that note, uh, we shall yeah. sign out then. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much Thank for listening. So much. Yes, from the Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Sham. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Avnita. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. -bye.